All right, so uh, you've already at this point, hopefully uh, done some reading on transcendentalism, answered some questions, and had a little introduction to it on your own, trying to figure it out. Uh, and uh, hopefully that was helpful, but I'm guessing that uh, you're still not an expert on transcendentalism. Well, here's the good news. The good news is I learned about transcendentalism whenever I was in high school. I studied transcendentalism when I was in college. I read the books of the transcendentalists and the things that they wrote. I have taught about transcendentalism for years now. And there's no way I would say that I'm an expert. In fact, I'm not so sure I fully even understand it. One of the things that I asked you to do was to define it. And I do that on purpose because that is very difficult to do. To define it specifically in one statement is nearly impossible. And you can look up all the experts that have studied it and, and, and have taught about it and understand it, and they'll all have different definitions. So rather than uh, come up with some textbook definition, I like to kind of break away from that and, and, and try to make sense of it and understand it and even define it in a couple different ways. Before I even bother with that though, just a few things that I will put in your notes. Let me make sure that you can see that, it's a little. There, yeah, you should be good. Uh, just a few pieces of factual information. Number one, this was a movement um, we're we're going to be talking about reform movements. We already talked about the Second Great Awakening and some religious movements. Transcendentalism, it, it's not a religion, although it is rooted in, in some ways in religious ideas. It's more of a philosophy, or we'll see at the end whenever I kind of sum it up. It's kind of like a way to live your life. Well, this philosophy and this way of living was centered in New England. It started in and around the Boston area and then kind of spread around that part of the country. Uh, the, the, the people that started this movement, most of them uh, were writers, philosophers, teachers. The two names that you need to associate most with Transcendentalism are Ralph Waldo Emerson, who's considered to be the father of Transcendentalism. He's the guy that sort of started this philosophical movement, this way of life. Um, you also read a little bit about, and you need to be able to identify Henry David Thoreau, who was sort of a pro uh, prodigy or a protege of uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and uh, another name that is sort of iconic in, in the uh, history of this movement of transcendentalism. We'll get uh, to him a little bit more later, too. All right, so uh, as I just said a minute ago, I, I don't think that trying to define it in terms of a textbook definition is the best way to do it. So let's break it down a little bit differently. First, I like to just break down the word itself transcendentalism which by the way is a nice big word you just start throwing around at the dinner table tonight you'll sound really smart what is the root of this word transcendentalism is it dental i don't think this has anything to do with your teeth does it no the root word is transcend it's actually a verb to transcend which means to go beyond or to rise above so if you want to look at it in real literal terms, um, I'm looking out the window right now and it's snowing out there outside the, the window on the other side of the wall. So the snow and the weather transcends that wall. It's, it, it's, it goes beyond it. It's on the other side. Uh, again, literally the ceiling tiles and the lights here in the ceiling, they transcend the floor. They're rising above it. They're above it. Now that's a real literal sense of the term. But... I think if you understand that, you can start to understand where the transcendentalists are coming from in terms of a way of life, a lifestyle, a way to live. They believe that we should try to transcend the normal everyday life. In fact, they believed that we had to transcend this normal everyday rigmarole that everybody gets caught up in thinks, and thinks so important in order to really find what's most important about being a human being, about life on this planet, about why we're all here. So uh, what we mean by transcending all that means the, 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 the transcendentalist really, I don't even know if they ever fully understood or could define it themselves, but what they did understand was this. All of this stuff, this this material world, these walls, these desks, these books, these cars we drive, these computers, these phones in our pockets, this money in our wallet, 
the busy schedule and rigmarole of our daily existence. The idea of following your schedule and, and keeping up with every that can't be all there is to this idea of life. This can't be the most important thing, all of this materialism that we get caught up in. They believe there had to be something more than that. Now, I don't know, and I've never spoken with Thoreau or Emerson, but I'm not so sure they even uh, ever really knew or found out themselves what that true meaning of life was. In fact, we'll put that up there. One of the first things I'm going to put in this next bullet is this idea of searching for the true meaning of life. I don't think they ever truly found it. Um, but what they did do was they lived their lives in ways that they felt would help them get closer to figuring it out. Whether they ever get there or not, probably not the most important thing. So how do you live your life in a transcendental way? Well, the transcendentalism, uh, the transcendentalists believe in all of these things and more, but I listed a few things. So I always look at it this way. Instead of trying to come up with a textbook definition, I like this list of concepts, ideas, uh, lifestyles, um, characteristics. And so I just listed a few things here. It was about searching for the true meaning of life. They were non-materialistic. They didn't think that the most important thing was having money in your pocket in one pocket and a, and a smartphone in your other. To them, that wasn't the most important thing. They weren't into material goods and material things. They were non-conformists. They believe that you shouldn't just go along with what society says. You shouldn't just do what everybody else does because that's what everybody does. You should be a non-conformist and go your own way and make your own path, whatever that might be. Consequently, they believed heavily in individualism. Be an individual. Be yourself. Uh, they also believe that you should question authority, which is connected to not conforming and being an individual. Now, this idea of questioning authority, the transcendentalists didn't say that you should just go out there and say, ah, forget about the rules and the laws. Forget about what the boss says. Forget about what the government says. That's not what they meant by that. What they meant was, don't just blindly follow along with what the rules are. Don't just blindly accept what the authority figures say, whether it's your government, your boss, whatever. They believed in questioning those ideas and making sure that they were morally right and then abiding by those morals that you believe in. Uh, if you believe that something is wrong and amoral, a rule, a law, what authority is telling you to do, then you should resist it. But they didn't believe in violent resistance to authority. In fact, I think it was Thoreau, one of these two wrote, uh, I'm gonna have to go back and look, one of them wrote an essay called Civil Disobedience. And in that essay, uh, he, he talks about how and why you should question authority. It's not about violently resisting, it's about resisting civilly by doing it peacefully. So uh, that's a, there's a lesson to be learned there in today's world as well. Uh, they believed in connecting with nature. We'll get back to Henry David Thoreau in a second. They believed in solitude. It's okay to be by yourself. Be with your own thoughts. Connect with nature by yourself, that kind of stuff. They, uh, again, it's not religious necessarily, although it's uh, rooted in some religious ideas. They were very spiritual. They believed that everybody could have some sort of spirituality, but what that meant was different probably for everybody. All right, so that's just a short little list of things that I think exemplify this lifestyle. So let me put it, uh, sum it up this way. Uh, I said a few minutes ago that if I, if you ask Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, what is the most important thing in life? What is the true meaning? Where did you get uh, after you did all these things and lived this lifestyle, they may tell you that they never really found the answer. They never really got there. They never transcended fully. But I think they would also tell you that that's not what's most important. What is most important is trying to get there, trying to figure it out, doing all of this and living this lifestyle. It, it reminds me of a song by one of my favorites, Miley Cyrus. I don't know if you guys are big Miley Cyrus fans, uh, she's kind of crazy, I understand that, but she is a good singer and she's a great writer. There's a song that she wrote a while back called The Climb. And when I listen to that song, it always makes me think, oh, you know what, I think Miley Cyrus gets it. I think she was into the idea of transcendentalism because that song, you can look it up and look at the lyrics or listen to it. In the song, it's all about 
climbing up this mountain to get to the top and to find out what's on the other side. And that's what it's all about, climbing up there and finding, and then at the end, you realize that you may never even make it to the other side. But guess what? That's not what's most important. What is important is the journey, is the climb, as the song says. And I think that the transcendentalists like Thoreau and Emerson would agree with that. Nobody exemplified all of this more than Henry David Thoreau. Henry David Thoreau, we learned, lived in the woods by himself in a small cabin that he built with his own bare hands out of uh, local materials. He was um, removed from his community and society. He walked the woods every day, connecting with nature, and he observed his natural environment. He didn't get caught up in materialism. He lived in a cabin that was like probably no bigger than the space that you're seeing me in on this camera here. It was really small. Um, we know that he questioned authority, but he did it civilly. Uh, in his lifetime, the United States fought a war with Mexico, the Mexican-American War, and he didn't agree with it. He also didn't agree with slavery, which he believed the war and slavery were intimately connected with one another. And because he didn't believe that we should be fighting this war, because he didn't believe in slavery, he was an abolitionist, he resisted by refusing to pay his taxes to the government because he believed that his tax dollars were going to support slavery and a war that he didn't agree with. Now, did uh, he take a bomb and blow up a government building? No, he did not. He disobeyed the laws civilly, back to the civil disobedience. It was Thoreau that wrote that. Um, of course, he was only in jail for like one night or something. His wealthy aunt paid his taxes, bailed him out of jail. But it wasn't, that's not the point. The point is he was trying to make a statement about what he believed in. So he went and he lived in the woods uh, for about two years. And while he was there, he was a writer. He ended up collecting all of his thoughts and his, his ideas and the things that he experienced and his connection with nature. And he wrote a book called Walden uh, because he lived in the woods uh, at a place called Walden Pond. Uh, it's a little bit boring, it's a little bit long, it's a little bit slow, but it is also an iconic piece of American literature, and it really is one of these uh, pieces of, of literature that helps us understand transcendentalism. I hope you have a little bit better uh, understanding of transcendentalism now. Um, uh, and if you don't understand it fully, don't worry. I don't think I really do either. You know what, one last thing, whether you fully understand it and get it or not doesn't really matter, but Ask yourself, could you use a little bit more of this in your own life? It's not that bad of an idea, is it? Now, are we just going to go live off in the woods for two years by ourselves like the road did? Probably not. But can it hurt to be by ourselves a little bit more? Maybe to unplug the phone every once in a while and, and, and disconnect from that. Maybe connect with the things in the natural world outside with nature and our environment. Uh, could it be okay to maybe not get caught up in all this materialism and all the, the things that we think are so important? Think about that, and my guess is you'll say, you know what, these guys are onto something.